Welcome again to my study. Today we finish up our investigation from the Geary book of causal studies, especially the sort that fit the big data model for how you go about testing for causation, which of course is the standard accepted way to test for things. So let's look a little bit at such causal studies involving experimental and control groups and see what the types are. Basically, there are three types that we need to think about. They overlap, so they're not logically independent of each other. So we're interested in double-blind studies and then double-blind studies and alternatives to double-blind studies can be either prospective or retrospective. So we'll characterize the difference and look at a couple of examples of each. So let's turn to the slides. So in these slides, we're going to talk, we're, we're headed to where we can characterize and understand the difference between prospective and retrospective designs. Double blind is probably a term you've heard before, and it would be ideal if all of our studies could employ a random experimental design. So we'll talk about that as well. Before we do so, let's characterize the program for answering questions when faced with reports about causal studies. So first, step number one, we have to identify the relevant population of interest, the population sampled. Some of this repeats what we learned when we talked about statistical studies. But remember, sometimes the population that's actually sampled doesn't line up with the population of interest, and that's important to note. And then we also identify the hypothesis being tested. We then take note of the sample data and the design of the experiment. Now, in our causal studies chapter, we want to know, did the experiment have a random experimental design, a double blind design, a perspective design, or a retrospective? Now, these last two are exclusive of each other, but the rest aren't. So you could have a random experimental design that was double blind and perspective, or random double blind and retrospective. The only thing that you can't have is both prospective and retrospective at one time. Random sampling would be the ideal, and that's what you need for a random experimental design. But identify variances from randomness if it wasn't a random sample. When randomness isn't present, note the areas of concern about the sampling and what was done to control for bias. So if you know that randomness isn't present and also there's no information about how they controlled for bias, that's a mark against the study. That's a mark against the conclusions being drawn from the study or the data that was generated. Finally, evaluate the hypothesis. Does the data support the hypothesis in question? To answer this question, estimate the probabilities in question using the margin of error information that we learned about when we studied statistical hypotheses, paying special attention to the margin of error for the estimate and whether there's any overlap in the estimates. We can then summarize, assess how good the evidence is for the hypothesis in question taking into account whatever reservations we have concerning the sampling method when it wasn't random. So we have six steps to our program. Identify the hypothesis and population, the data, talk about the design of the experiment, whether random sampling was present and what was done to control bias if it isn't, and then you evaluate the hypothesis with respect to the evidence and summarize. So first, let's talk about an example of a randomized experimental design. In such randomized experiments, the target po population might be sampled itself, or in many such cases, we use surrogates from other species to stand in for the population in question. This, of course, raises a question mark, because if you're interested in something about, say, as we're going to look at saccharin use in human beings and whether it's a dangerous practice, if you use surrogates from other species, you need to know 
something about why a certain surrogate is relevant and others aren't. So for example, here's an obvious case where you should have question marks in your mind. You want to know about saccharine use in human beings, and the study selected live oak trees and painted saccharin on the exterior of the live oak trees to see if the live oak trees die. Well, that's using a surrogate, but it's also using a surrogate that makes no sense to use. Scientists have some data for deciding which species are the most relevant for studying particular aspects of human beings, and they should be able to explain that. So if you're going to use mice and rats as surrogates for human beings, you better be able to explain why you think they're the most relevant species to be used for the study. And it better not be, be because simply it's easy to buy a bunch of rats and mice, and it's harder to buy, say, elk or moose or grizzly bears, and it's also harder to deal with grizzly bears. So you need some story as to why the surrogate being used is relevant for the study that you're conducting. Once you have the population and the sampling from it, whether surrogate or actual population, one possibility is to divide the pop population into those with the causal factor and those without. But if your surrogate is rats and mice and the causal factor is some artificial ingredient, you can't do that because if you're talking about saccharin and you get a bunch of rats and mice, none of them, it's an artificial causal factor, so none of them will have been exposed to it. So you can't do it that way. So what you do is get a sample of the population, either random or where biases are controlled for, then divide the sample into two groups, the X group and the K group. The X group is the experimental group. The control group is the K group. Notice that these are the names for the imaginary populations that we talked about in the last chapter relative to which we define causal relevance and causal effectiveness. We then generate correlational data from the two samples, comparing them to see whether the factor being tested for is correlated more strongly with an increase in the effect being looked for. So the example in the textbook has to do with saccharin and bladder cancer. And the surrogate population being used was rats. So take a look at the population, gather the sample data, note something about the sample size, note the experimental design and the causal model being employed, and notice also in this case that assignment to the X and K groups was done randomly. So under the assumption of randomness, what does the sample data show? And then we summarize. So those are, again, the six steps. We're going to apply that to the saccharin bladder case, bladder cancer case. So we have some data here, a chart of the data for the first offspring generation from the X and K groups. The first generation that was studied had 78 rats in the experimental group and 74 in the control group. And we got a difference. In the experimental group, 9% of them had bladder cancer. In the control group, only 1% did. But given the size of each of these groups, this difference was not statistically significant. When we move to the second generation of rats, though, we now have more rats in each group, 94 and 89. And what's interesting is in the control group, no incidences of cancer, but in the experimental group, 15%. And this one turned out to be statistically significant. So on the basis of this study, this study had greater power in part, it had greater power because the sample size was bigger. And it generated data that raised concern about the use of saccharin in human beings. Now, that last inference, of course, depends on knowing something about why rats are the appropriate organism to study as a surrogate for human beings.
Let's talk then about double blind designs. An experiment is blind where the subjects of the experiment don't know whether they're in the experimental group or the control group. So if your primary physician is doing a study on, oh, I don't know, just pick one of those supplements, chondroitin supplements for people who are experiencing some arthritic pain. And the doctor is just doing this low level experiment of his own where he's trying to decide, he wants to hear from patients over the next year or so, whether their arthritic symptoms have decreased as a result of taking chondroitin supplements. So he gives some of his patients the actual supplement and some a sugar pill, and then they come back in for their annual checkup a year later. That's a blind study because if you are one of the patients, you don't know whether you got the sugar pill or the actual chondroitin pill. An experiment is double blind when neither the researchers nor the subjects know which group they're in. So the study I just described, the doctor does know which of the two pills he gave you. So it's not double blind. In a double blind experiment, neither the researchers nor the subjects know. It's also possible to do something called a triple blind because there's a research team and then there's the people that they answer to. And I guess you could go up and keep everybody everywhere from knowing anything about which group the subjects are in. But the important one is that the researchers can't know which group you're in. Such a design, of course, is compatible with randomness in whether you're assigned to the experimental group or the control group. But it's usually used because there is no randomness in the setup, especially when the test subjects are human beings. Except in determining whether a given subject is in the control group or the experimental group. So the vitamin C example in the textbook is an example of a double blind experiment. The idea was some people have thought that uh, the cure for certain sorts of common ailments, the common cold and other sorts of things was vitamin C. So they did a study on 279 skiers in Europe, where I think this is supposed to be half. Half were given one gram per day of vitamin C and the other half a placebo. It's a double blind study, so the skiers didn't know which group they were in, nor did the people handing out the pills and doing the research. What researchers found was that there's a 61% reduction in sick days from upper respiratory infections in the vitamin C group. Moreover, when the report was studied, the significance level was given at the 0.001 level which is extremely high. Remember, the typical standard is 0.05. So this is a really high level of statistical significance for the results that were achieved. And so people thought, maybe, maybe there's something to this vitamin C thing. When you think about this experiment, the first thing you ought to wonder about, though, is if you're wondering about the population of human beings in general, are skiers a representative sample of that? Is there anything that might be different about skiers that would undermine the inference from this experiment to the population at large, which is the population of interest, human beings? And there you should have some serious questions. First, I think these were all in either Austria or Swiss. I didn't look back at what the description was exactly. But if they're Austrians or Swiss people, or people who are wintering in those areas, they probably have they probably have more money than you and I do, for one thing. They have a certain racial profile that isn't representative of humanity at large. Maybe they're also healthier and younger than humanity at large. There's lots of things to worry about here. So the fact that this works for skiers 
it might not translate all that well to the population at large, but it's still a really important and significant study of the value of vitamin C. The other thing about vitamin C, going back to this slide, is we know something about what happens if you take vitamin C and you didn't need to do so or it's not having any positive effect. When you do those sorts of things, your first question is, what are the downsides to taking vitamin C or other supplements? Well, usually there's some health risks associated with mega dosing on things, but it turns out vitamin C is water soluble, so it ends up in your toilet when it's not used. And so if it didn't do any good, it just passes through the body and you're just out a few bucks, but probably a gram per day of vitamin C isn't going to break the bank for most of us, at least. The most important studies, though, are the ones that are prospective and retrospective, and they're the most sophisticated studies that we're going to look at. So let's talk about the difference between prospective and retrospective designs. We will do that with some studies having to do with schizophrenia. So first, you're looking for whether schizophrenia is environmentally induced or genetically caused. So to figure out the difference between that, researchers looked at pairs of twins. And if they were raised the same by the same parents, you have some sense that the assumption of environmental factors is roughly the same for them. So then you take the pairs of twins and you divide them into the two groups that they fall into. So there are maternal twins, which are identical, and fraternal twins, which are not identical genetically. The identical twins are then the experimental group since they have the causal factor in question. Non-identical twins are the control group since they share no more genetic material than ordinary siblings. So why is this a prospective design study? Notice that subjects for the study are picked on the basis of the causal factor being tested for. It has a prospective design because you identify the control group before you know anything about whether the effect will show up later. So you select on the basis of the causal factor and then you wait around to see or you look at their files to see who developed the effect and who didn't. The design of the study is to try to isolate genetic factors from other factors by finding pairs to put into the two groups that are alike as possible in the relevant respects. This is something that I talked about when we talked about p-hacking and the ways in which causal studies can be undermined by stuff that you didn't take into account. So I'm just going to remind you of the case rather than spend any time on it. The example that I used for the necessity of controlling for other known causal factors has to do with the birth control studies about thrombosis. And what they failed initially to take into account was that people who take birth control pills have a lower incidence of pregnancy than those who don't. And pregnancy is itself a cause of thrombosis. So when you're doing a study of this sort, one of the things that's always in the back of your mind is, what, do I, what am I doing to control for other known causal factors? And it also has to be in the back of your mind, do we really have a good grip on what the other known factors, what the other factors really are? Or are we shooting in the dark here where we have really no clue about anything that we could control for when we do the study? So that's a lesson about controlling for other causal factors when you do studies of this sort. Retrospective design runs in the opposite direction. So in a retrospective study, you begin by selecting as your experimental group individuals that display the effect you're trying to find the cause of. One then looks back in time to try to identify the suspected causal factor. You then compare the frequency of the suspected causal factor in the experimental group with its frequency in a control group looking for a statistically significant difference, as we do in all of these studies. 
So the really interesting one is the study that looked at this particular DTNBP1 gene as a cause of schizophrenia. So within the gene in question, there are several single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, that researchers tested for. For one of these, the P, this is not an illuminating name, but in any case, it's the P1578 SNP. The frequency differences are fairly dramatic, with an 86% increase in the experimental group of whites and Hispanics compared to the control group. So they divided each of the groups by racial categories into white, Hispanic, and black. They found this really high difference in whites and Hispanics, but they didn't find it in blacks, which is um, somewhat surprising and puzzling. You'd like to know, I wonder why that would be. That would be a matter for further research. But in any case, you got a dramatic increase in frequency of this particular gene. The study led researchers to conclude that there's little doubt that this gene is a significant causal factor for schizophrenia. So the idea is schizophrenia is just not an environmentally induced mental illness. It's genetically caused, at least in part. The study can't tell you that it's solely a genetic abnormality, but finding that it has some sort of genetic basis is an important thing to notice. Now here's a qualification about these kinds of studies. Note here that we don't have some information we'd want for assessing the report. We can't estimate probabilities without some information about margins of error. So if you look at this description, we don't get any numbers. We get one particular number, but we don't get any information about how to do estimates from that sample since we're not told in this report right now what the margins of error. To get that, we need the actual percentages as well as the size of the experimental and control groups. So here are some of the characteristics of studies of this sort. Non-randomly selected experimental and control groups, that's characteristic of these sorts of studies. For the control group, efforts are typically made to match the characteristics of the experimental group in terms of gender, age, ethnicity, etc., to the population we're interested in drawing conclusions about. So typical efforts are made to control for bias in the sample that's being used. In the schizophrenia study, the experimental group had significantly higher male representation, but the author of the studies noted that there is no known evidence of a gender-based difference in the genetic effects on schizophrenia. Okay, now this is an important qualification because you might, I mean, this is a red flag first, and then it's addressed by talking about whether there is known evidence that would make this difference problematic. So the idea that they're following is to first note the difference and then inquire, is there a good reason to disqualify the study on this basis? In reputable studies, the issue is addressed, and if there is a body of information that suggests that the difference isn't relevant, that's different from there being no evidence either way. So when they say there is no known evidence, when the authors say that, what they're saying is something stronger than we simply have no evidence. They're saying we have a lot of information available to us, and it reveals no evidence at all of a gender-based difference here. So this is not simply an appeal to ignorance. Think about the way this went in the last election. So some conservatives were worried about voter fraud in the election. And news reports kept saying and kept citing people who were saying there's no evidence of it. Well, there's two things that that could involve. One is nobody's looked, and so there's no evidence. Another thing is there's been extensive efforts to detect fraud and find it, and no evidence of fraud ever showed up in these sorts of things. That's a different kind of there's no known evidence claim. 
what you should expect in relevant studies is there is a body of information where the issue was investigated, it was done responsibly, and it revealed no cause for concern. So appeals to ignorance are just, we don't know that this is a problem, so we'll ignore it. That's an appeal to ignorance. This is not an appeal to ignorance. This is an appeal to a body of evidence that doesn't reveal any cause for concern. That's a different epistemological standpoint than appeals to ignorance typically have. A second thing to note here is a disadvantage of retrospective studies. One disadvantage, and a major one, is that such studies don't allow any estimate of the effectiveness of the cause. So when you do a retrospective study, you can identify something and infer that it's a cause in the population. But if you're asking how much of a cause is it, what's the effectiveness of this causal factor, the study simply doesn't allow you to do that. It's a limitation on retrospective designs in comparison with other kinds of designs. In general, if we have non-random samples, there are certain kinds of problems that we know about and we have to take into account in evaluating this. So first is a non-response bias. What do you do when some of the individuals in your study simply won't respond? Well, typically you replace them with other, with other people in the sample. If, for example, you're doing political surveys, you just replace the non-responsive people with other people having the same general characteristics. But of course, that assumes that given what you're trying to investigate is not itself correlated. The responses, whether you're responsive or non-responsive, can't be correlated with what is being examined. So think about political surveys where you're trying to see who's going to vote Republican and who's going to vote Democrat, and then you call a whole bunch of people. And it turns out some people refuse to talk to you. So you've got all of these other factors, right? You're controlling for race, religion, income level, geographic location. You're doing, you're controlling for all of these so that the percentage in your sample of a certain race matches the percentage in the population at large. And so when you get a non-responsive person, they have been selected because they fit a certain profile in terms of the um, in terms of the biases you're controlling for. But what if responsiveness itself is a bias? So maybe non-responsive people are more likely to vote Republican than Democrat. There's some evidence that this is the case with respect to Trump voters. Sometimes they're called shy Trumpers, but it's not shyness. It's just, uh, get out of my face. I don't answer questions from people like you move on to somebody else. Well, if you're a cranky responder to pollsters, I'm one of those, by the way, I don't like talking to people doing polls, you're wasting my time. If you want to start paying me, maybe I'll take some time to talk to you, but not otherwise. In any case, this bias is a big question mark, and you need to, you need to figure out how to assess it in a given case, and perhaps try to control for it if you're the researcher. Here's another one. Non-random studies, you get a surveillance bias. So suppose you're trying to see whether taking birth control pills causes breast cancer. The surveillance bias is once you start thinking about this, it turns out people who take the pill are tested much more widely for breast cancer than people who don't take the pill. And so you're going to end up perhaps getting more incidences reported for breast cancer when people are taking the pill than you would otherwise, but just because people are paying attention on the breast cancer issue to people who take pill, take the birth control pill. Here's one that we talked about earlier, the recall bias. So suppose you go to your doctor and you've been diagnosed with breast cancer. One of the things they'll start looking at and you'll be interested in is why did I get breast cancer? So they'll be asking you, have you taken birth control pills in the last five years? And now you're relying for your data on patient recall. Because not always does the medical doctor have 
access to the information about what your history has been. But it turns out such recall, when you actually test it, such recall is biased in the over-reporting direction. Lots more women who develop breast cancer report having taken birth control pills in the last five years than actually did so. They're not lying, it's just, well, maybe some of them are lying, but I don't know why you would do that. It's really just an unreliability of human recall. Human memory is surprisingly inventive in very troubling ways. And this is one of the ways that bias can get introduced into non-random samples. And obviously there's also interviewer bias. Interviewers can generate a bias in a certain direction in completely unknowing and unintentional ways because human observers are very sophisticated cognizers. This happens, by the way, when you have human interaction with other animal species other than humans. We convey information to other animals in ways that are completely surprising. They pick up on things that are going on and respond to them in ways that were completely unintended. Well, if the interviewer has a bias and is trying to hide it, it's very hard to do so. Human beings are very, very good at detecting things that you don't say. I mean, some of us think we have a really good poker face. And so you do the poker face things, thing, and then it turns out you don't really do a very good job of keeping what you're thinking from the people observing you. One last word, things we've talked about before. I did a separate lecture on this, so we don't need to go over it. But these are clickable links where you can follow up, if you would like, on some of the problems on false discovery rates and p-values and how p-hacking occurs. I believe this one was one of the videos that I did a short snippet from. Uh, this is the next two are by the guy who published the article in 2005 on why most reported research or too much of it is wrong. This is a really shorter explanation and here's a much longer one, but I warn you that the quality of these videos, they're kind of old and so they're not uh, high quality. This is an updated version of the same thing. So this is worth checking out if you're interested in false discovery rates and p-hacking. In any case, that's all we need to do for the chapter on causal studies. And the important thing to notice is we are looking primarily at the difference between prospective and retrospective designs. These are nicer experiments because they allow for a measure of the effectiveness of the causal factor. But often the only information we can get at is through a retrospective design, and then we just get an on-off switch on whether we've identified a causal factor or not, but we don't get information about the degree to which the causal factor is effective. And so retrospective studies don't give us as much input for our decision-making as we would like. In the last two chapters, we will turn to a discussion of decision theory and its application to see how to apply some of this information that we've been learning so far.